lest we forget, ideas have consequences. When the communists established the Soviet Union after the First World War, people could be forgiven for hoping that the utopian collectivist dreams their new leaders purveyed were possible. The decayed social order of the late 19th century produced the trenches and mass slaughters of the Great War. The gap between the rich and poor was extreme and most people slaved away in conditions worse than those later described by Orwell. Although the West received word of the horror perpetrated by Lenin after the Russian Revolution, it remained difficult to evaluate his actions from afar. Russia was in post-monarchical chaos, and the news of widespread industrial development and redistribution of property to those who had so recently been serfs provided reason for hope. To complicate things further, the USSR and Mexico supported the Democratic Republicans when the Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936. They were fighting against the essentially fascist nationalists who had overthrown the fragile democracy established only five years previously and who found support with the Nazis and Italian fascists. The intelligentsia in America, Great Britain, and elsewhere were severely frustrated by their home country's neutrality. Thousands of foreigners streamed into Spain to fight for the Republicans, serving in the international brigades. George Orwell was one of them. Ernest Hemingway served there as a journalist and was a supporter of the Republicans. Politically concerned young Americans, Canadians, and Brits felt a moral obligation to stop talking and start fighting. All of this drew attention away from the concurrent events in the Soviet Union. In the 1930s, during the Great Depression, the Stalinist Soviets sent two million kulaks, their richest peasants, to Siberia, those with a small number of cows, a couple of hired hands, or a few acres more than was typical. From the communist viewpoint, these kulaks had gathered their wealth by plundering those around them and deserved their fate. Wealth signified oppression, and private property was theft. It was time for some equity. More than 30,000 kulaks were shot on the spot. Many more met their fate at the hands of their most jealous, resentful, and unproductive neighbors, who used the high ideals of communist collectivization to mask their murderous intent. The kulaks were enemies of the people, apes, scum, vermin, filth, and swine. We will make soap out of the kulak, claimed one particularly brutal cater of city dwellers, mobilized by party and Soviet executive committees and sent out into the countryside. The kulaks were driven naked into the streets, beaten, and forced to dig their own graves. The women were raped. Their belongings were expropriated which in practice meant that their houses were stripped down to the rafters and ceiling beams and everything was stolen. In many places, the non-Kulak peasants resisted, particularly the women, who took to surrounding the persecuted families with their bodies. Such resistance proved futile. The Kulaks who didn't die were exiled to Siberia, often in the middle of the night. The trains started in February in the bitter Russian cold. Housing of the most substandard kind awaited them upon arrival on the desert taiga. Many died, particularly children, from typhoid, measles, and scarlet fever. The parasitical kulaks were, in general, the most skillful and hard-working farmers. A small minority of people are responsible for most of the production in any field, and farming proved no different. Agricultural output crashed. What little remained was taken by force out of the countryside and into the cities. Rural people who went out into the fields after the harvest to glean single grains of wheat for their hungry families risked execution. Six million people died of starvation in the Ukraine, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, in the 1930s. To eat your own children is a barbarian act, declared posters of the Soviet regime. Despite more than mere rumors of such atrocities, attitudes towards communism remained consistently positive among many Western intellectuals. There were other things to worry about, and the Second World War allied the Soviet Union with the Western countries opposing Hitler, Mussolini, and Hirohito. Certain watchful eyes remained open, nonetheless. Malcolm Mudridge published a series of articles describing Soviet demolition of the peasantry as early as 1933 for the Manchester Guardian. George Orwell understood what was going on under Stalin, and he made it widely known. He published Animal Farm, a fable satirizing the Soviet Union in 1945, despite encountering serious resistance to the book's release. Many who should have known better 
retained their blindness for long after this. Nowhere was this truer than France, and nowhere truer in France than among the intellectuals. France's most famous mid-century philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, was a well-known communist, although not a card carrier, until he denounced the Soviet incursion into Hungary in 1956. He remained an advocate for Marxism nonetheless and did not finally break with the Soviet Union until 1968 when the Soviets violently suppressed the Czechoslovakians during the Prague Spring. Not long after came the publication of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, which we have discussed rather extensively in previous chapters. As noted, and is worth noting again, this book utterly demolished communism's moral credibility, first in the West, and then in the Soviet system itself. It circulated in underground samizdat format. Russians had 24 hours to read their rare copy before handing it to the next waiting mind. A Russian language reading was broadcast into the Soviet Union by Radio Liberty. Solzhenitsyn argued that the Soviet system could have never survived without tyranny and slave labor, that the seeds of its worst excesses were definitively sowed in the time of Lenin, for whom the Western communists still served as apologists, and that it was propped up by endless lies, both individual and public. Its sins could not be blamed on a single cult of personality as its supporters continued to claim. Solzhenitsyn documented the Soviet Union's extensive mistreatment of political prisoners, its corrupt legal system, and its mass murders, and showed in painstaking detail how these were not aberrations but direct expressions of the underlying communist philosophy. No one could stand up for communism after the Gulag Archipelago, not even the communists themselves. This did not mean that the fascination Marxist ideas had for intellectuals, particularly French intellectuals, disappeared. It merely transformed. Some refused outright to learn. Sartre denounced Solzhenitsyn as a dangerous element. Derrida, more subtle, substituted the idea of power for the idea of money, and continued on his merry way. Such linguistic sleight of hand gave all the barely repentant Marxists still inhabiting the intellectual pinnacles of the West the means to retain their worldview. Society was no longer repression of the poor by the rich. It was oppression of everyone by the powerful. According to Derrida, hierarchical structures emerged only to include the beneficiaries of that structure and to exclude everyone else who was therefore oppressed. Even that claim wasn't sufficiently radical. Derrida claimed that divisiveness and oppression were built right into language, built into the very categories we use to pragmatically simplify and negotiate the world. There are women only because men gain by excluding them. There are males and females only because members of that more heterogeneous group benefit by excluding the tiny minority of people whose biological sexuality is amorphous. Science only benefits the scientists. Politics only benefits the politicians. In Derrida's view, hierarchies exist because they gain from oppressing those who are omitted. It is this ill-gotten gain that allows them to flourish. Derrida famously said, although he denied it later, Il n'y a pas du hors texte, often translated as, there is nothing outside the text. His supporters say that this is a mistranslation, and that the English equivalent should have been, there is no outside text. It remains difficult either way to read the statement as saying anything other than, everything is interpretation, and that is how Derrida's work has generally been interpreted. It is almost impossible to overestimate the nihilistic and destructive nature of this philosophy. It puts the act of categorization itself in doubt. It negates the idea that distinctions might be drawn between things for any reasons other than that of raw power. Biological distinctions between men and women? Despite the existence of an overwhelming multidisciplinary scientific literature indicating that sex differences are powerfully influenced by biological factors, science is just another game of power for, for Derrida and his postmodernist Marxist acolytes, making claims to benefit those at the pinnacle of the scientific world? There are no facts. Hierarchical position and reputation as a consequence of skill and competence? All definitions of skill and of competence are merely made up by those who benefit from them to exclude others and to benefit personally and selfishly. There is sufficient truth to Derrida's claims to account, in part, for their insidious nature. Power is a fundamental motivational force. A, not the 
people compete to rise to the top, and they care where they are in dominance hierarchies. But, and this is where you separate the metaphorical boys from the men philosophically, the fact that power plays a role in human motivation does not mean that it plays the only role, or even the primary role. Likewise, the fact that we can never know everything does make all our observations and utterances dependent on taking some things into account and leaving other things out, as we discussed extensively in Rule 10. That does not justify the claim that everything is interpretation or that categorization is just exclusion. Beware of single-cause interpretations, and beware the people who purvey them. Although the facts cannot speak for themselves, just as an expanse of land spread out before a voyager cannot tell him how to journey through it, and although there are a myriad ways to interact with, even to perceive, even a small number of objects, that does not mean that all interpretations are equally valid. Some hurt yourself and others. Others put you on a collision course with society. Some are not sustainable across time. Others do not get you where you want to go. Many of these constraints are built into us as a consequence of billions of years of evolutionary processes. Others emerge as we are socialized into cooperating and competing peacefully and productively with others. Still more interpretations emerge as we discard counterproductive strategies through learning. An endless number of interpretations, certainly. That is not different than saying an endless number of problems, but a seriously bounded number of viable solutions. Otherwise, life would be easy. And it's not. Now, I have some beliefs that might be regarded as left-leaning. I think, for example, that the tendency for valuable goods to distribute themselves with pronounced inequality constitutes an ever-present threat to the stability of society. I think there is good evidence for that. That does not mean that the solution to the problem is self-evident. We don't know how to redistribute wealth without introducing a whole host of other problems. Different Western societies have tried different approaches. The Swedes, for example, push equality to its limit. The U.S. takes the opposite tack, assuming that the net wealth creation of a more free-for-all capitalism constitutes the rising tide that lifts all boats. The results of these experiments are not all in and countries differ very much in relevant ways. Differences in history, geographic area, population size, ethnic diversity make direct comparisons very difficult. But it certainly is the case that forced redistribution in the name of utopian equality is a cure to shame the disease. I think, as well, on what might be considered the leftist side, that the incremental remake of university administrations into analogs of private corporations is a mistake. I think that the science of management is a pseudo-discipline. I believe that government can, sometimes, be a force for good, as well as the necessary arbiter of a small set of necessary rules. Nonetheless, I do not understand why our society is providing public funding to institutions and educators whose stated, conscious and explicit aim is the demolition of the culture that supports them. Such people have a perfect right in their opinions and actions if they remain lawful but they have no reasonable claim to public funding. If radical right-wingers were receiving state funding for political operations disguised as university courses, as the radical left-wingers clearly are, the uproar from progressives across North America would be deafening. There are other serious problems lurking in the radical disciplines apart from the falseness of their theories and methods and their insistence that collective political activism is morally obligatory. There isn't a shred of hard evidence to support any of their central claims, that Western society is pathologically patriarchal, that the prime lesson of history is that men, rather than nature, were the primary source of the oppression of women, rather than, as in most cases, their partners and supporters, that all hierarchies are based on power and aimed at exclusion. Hierarchies exist for many reasons, some arguably valid, some not, and are incredibly ancient evolutionarily speaking. Do male crustaceans oppress female crustaceans? Should their hierarchies be upended? In societies that are well-functioning, not in comparison to a hypothetical utopia, but contrasted with other existing or historical cultures, competence, not power, is a prime determiner of status. Competence, ability, skill, not power. This is obvious both anecdotally and factually. No one with brain cancer is equity-minded enough to refuse the service of the surgeon with the best education, the best reputation, and perhaps the highest earnings. 
Furthermore, the most valid personality trait predictors of long-term success in Western countries are intelligence, as measured with cognitive ability or IQ tests, and conscientiousness, a trait characterized by industriousness and orderliness. There are exceptions. Entrepreneurs and artists are higher in openness to experience, another cardinal personality trait, than in conscientiousness. But openness is associated with verbal intelligence and creativity, so that exception is appropriate and understandable. The predictive power of these traits, mathematically and economically speaking, is exceptionally high, among the highest in terms of power of anything ever actually measured at the harder ends of the social sciences. A good battery of personality slash cognitive tests can increase the probability of employing someone more competent than average from 50-50 to 85-15. These are the facts as well supported as anything in the social sciences, and this is saying more than you might think, as the social sciences are more effective disciplines than their cynical critics appreciate. Thus, not only is the state supporting one-sided radicalism, it is also supporting indoctrination. We do not teach our children that the world is flat. Neither should we teach them unsupported ideologically predicated theories about the nature of men and women, or the nature of hierarchy. It is not unreasonable to note, if the deconstructionists would leave it at that, that science can be biased by the interests of power, and to warn against that, or to point out that evidence is too often what powerful people, including scientists, decide it is. After all, scientists are people too, and people like power, just like pobsters, pobsters, <laughs> just like lobsters, like power. <laughs> Just like deconstructionists like to be known for their ideas and strive rightly to sit atop their academic hierarchies. But that doesn't mean that science, or even deconstructionism, is only about power. Why believe such a thing? Why insist upon it? Perhaps it's this, if only power exists, then the use of power becomes fully justifiable. There is no bounding such use by evidence, method, logic, or even the necessity for coherence. There is no bounding by anything outside the text. That leaves opinion and force. And the use of force is all too attractive under such circumstances, just as its employment in the service of that opinion is all too certain. The insane and incomprehensible postmodern insistence that all gender differences are socially constructed, for example, becomes all too understandable when its moral imperative is grasped, when its justification for force is once and for all understood. Society must be altered or bias eliminated until all outcomes are equitable. But the bedrock of the social constructionist position is the wish for the latter, not the belief in the justice of the former. Since all outcome inequalities must be eliminated, inequality being the heart of all evil, then all gender differences must be regarded as socially constructed. Otherwise, the drive for equality would be too radical, and the doctrine too blatantly propagandistic. Thus, the order of logic is reversed, so that the ideology can be camouflaged. The fact that such statements lead immediately to internal inconsistencies within the ideology is never addressed. Gender is constructed, but an individual who desires gender reassignment surgery is to be unarguably considered a man trapped in a woman's body, or vice versa. The fact that both of these cannot logically be true simultaneously is just ignored or rationalized away with another appalling postmodern claim that logic itself, along with the techniques of science, is merely part of the oppressive, patriarchal system. It is also the case, of course, that all outcomes cannot be equalized. First, outcomes must be measured. Comparing the salaries of people who occupy the same position is relatively straightforward, although complicated significantly by such things as date of hire, given the difference in demand for workers, for example, at different time periods. But there are other dimensions of comparison that are arguably equally relevant, such as tenure, promotion rate, and social influence. The introduction of the equal pay for equal work argument immediately complicates even salary comparison beyond practicality for one simple reason. Who decides what work is equal? It's not possible. That's why the marketplace exists. Worse is the problem of group comparison. Women should make as much as men, okay. Black women should make as much as white women, okay. Should salary then be adjusted for all parameters of race? At what level of resolution? What racial categories are real? The US National Institute of Health, to take a single bureaucratic example, 
recognizes American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and White. But there are more than 500 separate American Indian tribes. By what possible logic should American Indian, therefore, stand as a canonical category? Osage tribal members have a yearly average income of 30,000 while Tohono O'odams make 11,000. Are they equally oppressed? What about disabilities? Disabled people must make as much as non-disabled people. Okay, on the surface that's a noble, compassionate, fair claim. But who is disabled? Is someone living with a parent with Alzheimer's disease disabled? If not, why not? What about someone with a lower IQ? Someone less attractive? Someone overweight? Some people clearly move through life markedly overburdened with problems that are beyond their control, but it is a rare person indeed who isn't suffering from at least one serious catastrophe at any given time, particularly if you include their family in the equation. And why shouldn't you? Here's the fundamental problem. Group identity can be fractioned right down to the level of the individual. That sentence should be written in capital letters. Every person is unique, and not just in a trivial manner. Importantly, significantly, meaningfully unique. Group membership cannot capture that variability, period. None of this complexity is ever discussed by the postmodern Marxist thinkers. Instead, their ideological approach fixes a point of truth, like the North Star, and forces everything to rotate around it. The claim that all gender differences are a consequence of socialization is neither provable nor disprovable in some sense, because culture can be brought to bear with such force on groups or individuals that virtually any outcome is attainable if we are willing to bear the cost. We know, for example, from studies of adopted out identical twins, that culture can produce a 15 point, or one standard deviation increase in IQ, roughly the difference between the average high school student and the average state college student, at the cost of a three standard deviation increase in wealth. What this means, approximately, is that two identical twins, separated at birth, will differ in IQ by 15 points if the first twin is raised in a family that is poorer than 85% of families, and the second is raised in a family richer than 95% of families. Something similar has recently been demonstrated with education rather than wealth. We don't know what it would cost in wealth or differential education to produce a more extreme transformation. What such studies imply is that we could probably minimize the innate differences between boys and girls if we were willing to exert enough pressure. This would in no way ensure that we were freeing people of either gender to make their own choices. But choice has no place in the ideological picture. If men and women act voluntarily to produce gender unequal outcomes, those very choices must have been determined by cultural bias. In consequence, everyone is a brainwashed victim wherever gender differences exist and the rigorous critical theoretician is morally obligated to set them straight. This means that those already equity-minded Scandinavian males who aren't much into nursing require even more retraining. The same goes in principle for Scandinavian females who aren't much into engineering. What might such retraining look like? Where might its limits lie? Such things are often pushed past any reasonable limit before they are discontinued. Mao's murderous cultural revolution should have taught us that.